All right, it is time to move on and hear another social good rock star. And this is somebody that you have heard from before. If you live in Australia, and absolutely if you live in New South Wales, but really wherever you are watching today, you will have seen this gentleman, heard this gentleman, and feel like you know this gentleman. I'm referring, of course, to Shane Fitzsimmons, AFSM who's actually joining us today uh, by a pre-recorded video virtually in his latest role as the Commissioner of Resilience New South Wales. He was appointed as Commissioner for New South Wales Resilience uh, and Deputy Secretary Emergency Management with the Department of Premier and Cabinet uh, back in May 2020. His appointment followed his distinguished career, which is where most of us probably would have heard of him for the first time, possibly. Uh, back in his days not so long ago with the New South Wales Royal Rural Fire Service, the RFSS. Uh, he was part of the RFSS for over 35 years. He, uh, he was a volunteer there, but ultimately became the commissioner in uh, 2007 and remained until uh, in the middle of 2020. I'm sure you'll remember as the New South Wales bushfires burnt in 2019 and at the beginning of 2020 throughout New South Wales, it was Shane this seemingly unprepossessing man who became the face of the emergency work, as if from the smoke it was like he emerged to be the person that we connected with as, uh, as a community. Together with many well-deserved honours, way too many to mention, Shane has been awarded the RFS Long Service Medal and last year was actually awarded the uh, Father of the Year Award. And uh, I was lucky enough to meet him in person last year at a rural fire service conference. And I asked him, as I've asked all of our speakers, what is something about you that our audience won't know? And he shared something with me that I'm sure he's going to be fine with me sharing with you. Uh, at primary school, young Shane Fitzsimmons was a ballet dancer with the Terry Hills Junior Ballet School. And he was pretty damn good as well. Uh, as for today, so given, I think we would all understand, given the current storms and the flood crisis that is going on uh, around the place, it became apparent last week that Shane, given his role, wasn't going to be able to take the time out to actually make his way here today in person. I'm sure you would understand. But despite the devastating uh, floods and storms that were taking place, he still took time out of his day a week ago. And I was lucky enough to sit down with him online and have a little bit of a chat about climate change and what's going on right now and the work that he does. So by way of uh, virtual online video, which is becoming so common in uh, conferences these days. It still gives me great pleasure. And even though he won't hear you, can you please give a huge round of applause for the Commissioner of Resilience, Shane Fitzsimmons. All right, Shane, thank you very much for joining us in a way that I guess you're pretty used to talking to people in this new Zoom forum, but we appreciate your time. Before we get into the questions, I just wanted to ask you a, a different question. I gather you are always busy, but did you at least get the opportunity during the recent Christmas holiday break to not work for a little while? Oh, g'day, Andrew. It's great to be with you. And and look, I, I, I had a pretty quiet Christmas, largely stayed at home, but I, I did duck out to Broken Hill and back a couple of times to help my daughter relocate uh, up towards the Newcastle area. So... Uh, I've got to see a bit of the country and particularly how it's faring up uh, with all this rainfall and all this growth, which is quite a contrast compared to we were only a few years ago. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually, it's pouring outside uh, here as, I, as I'm talking to you. I understand that. The conditions that you were talking about. Just before I do, what were some of the learnings that you had? You mentioned the fires, obviously. What were some of the, the main challenges and I guess learnings that you personally had um, from that period? Uh, there's no doubt, like the rest of uh, people impacted and affected by those fires, uh, I think the I think the realization and the comprehension of the scale of damage, of the scale of displacement, and indeed the grief, uh, losing 26 lives, just under two and a half thousand homes, having 160 consecutive days of high intensity firefighting operations, with fire behaviour and fire spread, you know, breaching 
you know, conventional modelling and the best available science for, for predictive services. It took an enormous toll. Uh, and like so many others, there are dates and times uh, that changed us forever. There, there are memories and points throughout that season uh, that will stick with us for a lifetime. And people are genuinely grieving uh, the loss of loved ones. For me, um, uh, as part of that firefighting effort, um, losing our seven firefighters, our four volunteers, Jeff and Andrew, uh, Sam and Cole, and then the three air crew when the large aeroplane crashed in January, um, Rick, Ian and Paul, uh, all paying the ultimate price uh, for the want of nothing more than to make a positive difference in the community. Uh, it was really difficult. But equally, uh, Andrew, um, I reflect back on that time uh, with the visits that I was able to do around the state during the firefighting effort, uh, the partnerships and the teamwork that I was a part of at the State Operations Centre, not just internally with the Rural Fire Service, uh, but also our colleagues from right across the Fire and Emergency Services fraternity, the whole of government effort. I've never seen uh, a collaboration, a commitment, a, a resolve to do our very best for the people of New South Wales. Uh, egos were parked at the door. There was extraordinary collaboration and unification of purpose and focus. Um, we saw extraordinary utilisation of people, uh, of equipment and resources. We had more than 6,500 people, every state and territory come to our aid in Australia, including colleagues from New Zealand, United States and Canada. And, and in the heat of all of that, whilst I reflect very much uh, with despair and sadness at the toll and the impact. In a bittersweet way, I also reflect very much on the immense pride um, uh, to be Australian, uh, the reinforcement uh, of values such as mateship, this genuine outpouring of love and compassion and camaraderie to really help those that are doing it tough, those that are suffering, and for some, suffering the ultimate loss of loved ones and, and neighbours but losing livelihoods, losing businesses, losing homes, losing everything they'd ever worked for and collected in their lives. Uh, there are so many stories that will sit with me forever of this remarkable, genuine, sincere outpouring of love and generosity and care, whether people were doing it uh, with their own selves, providing their own labour to make a difference in some of these hard hit areas, whether they were opening their doors to provide temporary accommodation, makeshift accommodation for those that were were, were, were displaced uh, or, or homeless for, for a period of time, uh, whether it was a provision of goods and materials, uh, and of course, this remarkable generosity through donations uh, that lifted the spirits of all those impacted and affected. And, and I reflect on that fire season very much uh, through two lenses. Um, uh, one is the extraordinary loss and sacrifice, but also uh, the remarkable unification and pride to be part of something where people really did come together, parked all those egos at the door and just did their very best uh, in, in, in a most extraordinarily joined up way uh, for the people of our state. And I know that extends elsewhere outside of New South Wales, but obviously I've got a New South Wales uh, lens there that, which, which I'm looking through. Yeah, absolutely. It did amongst the tragedy. It certainly did show the very, very best of human nature, as you say, not just in New South Wales, but the whole country and, and other countries. Uh, you mentioned before the, uh, the weather conditions and in recent years, there's certainly been a, an increasing focus on the impact of climate change on weather conditions, on those extreme weather conditions. How does that factor into your thinking there at Resilience New South Wales? Oh, look, it's, it's been part of my thinking and therefore part of our thinking uh, uh, for decades now. And, and in my previous role with the Rural Fire Service, despite some of the rhetoric you hear in the, in the media and the reports, I've had the benefit of working from, for ministers from the three primary parties, uh, Labor Party, National Party, uh, and the Liberal Party. Uh, and as long as I can remember, certainly in the last more than decade that I was the Commissioner of the Rural Fire Service, myself and my deputy and my team, uh, every minister, every government, uh, we would frame up business cases and arguments, looking to the future, looking to the future about what the forecast was signalling um, about the potential for longer, hotter um, um, fire seasons, that there's going to be shrinking windows of opportunity uh, to, to deliver on things like hazard reduction burning and other mitigation programs that were weather dependent, that the potential for the longer seasons um, uh, and the more frequent and intense weather events that would drive behaviour, that would drive intensity. 
that translated to things like how do we shift policy? How do we shift argument and resources around things like optimising capabilities and capacities to deliver on, on mitigation programs and hazard reduction programs in a shrinking window of opportunity environment? When we look at the, when we look at the scale of resourcing and equipment and technology that would be needed to, to identify and get on top of fires quickly, um, when we looked at high capacity assets like large aircraft, that we typically share on a global basis between the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, uh, the ability to argue that while our seasons were extending and expectations for, 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 for significant resource availability was increasing, and similarly the Northern Hemisphere uh, seasons were extending, the availability of some of those limited resources was starting to overlap. So being able to frame arguments, everything from uh, significant adjustments to policy uh, significant adjustments to uh, investment and equipment and resources. Um, and some of those uh, really would centre around mitigation crews, uh, dedicated teams, workforces, um, and right through to, to probably most recently, some of the very um, visible uh, demonstration of that would be that New South Wales uh, was the only uh, jurisdiction in, in the nation that got the support of their government to buy our very own dedicated large air tanker uh, that we've now subsequently since owning it, shared it with every jurisdiction around Australia. And it's even been back over to, to the United States to help with firefighting. So being able to frame arguments, um, um, sensible arguments around, around what the science is suggesting and what that might mean in terms of, of shift in policy, uh, practice, uh, but also investment uh, in programs and equipment uh, has always been a feature of, of, of my thinking, of our thinking. Uh, and we're certainly uh, working very closely uh, in, in the new role with Resilience New South Wales, whilst we're not taking our eyes off or our efforts off the recovery, the ongoing compounding recovery effort, we're also uh, working uh, with partner agencies and organisations to frame up the, the initial state resilience strategy, which doesn't seek to, to replicate other significant um, state policy instruments uh, like climate adaptation and all those sorts of things, but actually recognising um, and, 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 and synthesising, if you like, with those broad policy elements. And then what does that mean to building resilience um, for the future ahead uh, with all those sorts of things, whether it's, whether it's the climate drivers and influences and patterns that we can expect, or indeed whether it's things like um, shifting and, and, and changing uh, demographic profiles and demographic distributions and and land use patterns and all those sorts of things. So they're absolutely being factored into um, uh, the broader thinking uh, of what can we do now uh, to better position ourselves uh, looking ahead. And without labouring the point too much, Andrew, I think um, the word resilience um, wasn't going to be the title of our agency when I first agreed to take the role. Well, I, I had in my head a simple organisation like Disaster and Emergency Management for the State, and as a simple firefighter, I kind of got that. Uh, but they but they talked about the word resilience uh, and, and they, they wanted it to mean more than just your typical focus on disaster and emergency management. And as I've travelled around and talked to people and reflected a lot on the last couple of decades of my time uh, in fire and emergency services, our lens looking forward, I don't support the simple definitions of resilience being bouncing back to normal after disaster or disruption. Uh, A, what is normal? Uh, and B, why do we want to go back to that state and be just as vulnerable or susceptible to, uh, to the next time. So, so for me, resilience is about learning through lived experiences so that we can develop um, uh, new skills, uh, that we can be better minded as to what we can expect and set the, set the forecast uh, uh, more appropriately, that we can invest uh, in programs, in systems, in infrastructure uh, that can better ready ourselves to hopefully prevent or mitigate what might be coming. But if it happens, how do we endure? And then how do we learn through that program, come out the other side, better, wiser, stronger, and more capable for the next turn? So, so it, is a, it, is a, it is an evolving uh, a, a, and living sequence, uh, but it's actually living through those lived experiences. Hopefully, we don't all wait for our personal lived experiences to learn the lessons that we seek to learn from one another, both domestically and abroad so that we can understand those lessons and factor them into our thinking and our planning, our policy architectures, uh, and of course, our investments. 
Absolutely. Uh, Shane, we've got a couple of minutes to go. I've got one final question that actually ties in really nicely with uh, what you just said regarding the word resilience. Resilience, amongst other things, has a, an optimistic tone to it. And I know having heard you speak before just last year that you are an optimist and a, bit, a very modest one, but you're, you yourself are doing your bit to help society. Um, as we move towards 2030. And so my question is around 2030, it's actually not very far away anymore. When we first started throwing the 2030 year around, it seemed like it was in the distant uh, future. It's now very close. What world, final question, what world do you want to live in by 2030? It's a really good question, Andrew. And I, and I, I truly believe uh, we are living in a wonderful world. And what I want to do, I want to see that world evolve uh, and, and, and harbour the lessons, particularly for us here in New South Wales and Australia, the extraordinary confronting lessons of the last couple of years, um, whether it was, was droughts that were immediately before the fires, um, uh, whether it's the COVID and the storms and the floods and the subsequent variants and the subsequent storms and floods. Um, we've had an extraordinary succession of, of displacing and tragic events that have, that have befallen us. And whilst I do look through a lens of risk and what comes next, and obviously I, I, some people say I put a bit of a negative lens on that because I'm always thinking about what could go wrong and what could happen. I'm also very optimistic because as we reflected just a little bit earlier, when the chips are down, we really do unite together for the common good. But usually in our life experiences, disasters happen somewhere to someone or some community. And they're usually geographically constrained. And we all have this genuine outpouring of sympathy and empathy and, and this compassion and this support that goes to goes towards those impacted uh, areas. But then we all tend to move on with our busy life because life just keeps going. I think what COVID has done for us in the last couple of years has reminded us that we are all vulnerable and susceptible to something. I think it's caused us to really have a good look at and, and ask ourselves at, at, at an individual level, at a family unit level, uh, in our social circles, and indeed in our business and government interactions, the word resilience is being used ubiquitously. It is everywhere in every conversation. And I know it's not just because I've taken on this agency. I just can't remember a time in my life where we've talked about it so much. And with all the challenges, with all the concerns, the vast majority of society has subscribed to a very considered and informed based debate we, 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 we have moved in the main, in mainstream media, in social media, beyond the extremities of, of, of meaningful dialogue. And, and historically, I think what we see, if we're talking about big policy issues, we often dominate the debate by one more, more moronic element at this end and the other moronic element at that end. And we all tend to overlook the core element uh, of evidence, of argument, of expertise to understand what's going on and what needs to go on. I think that I think the messaging and the engagement through the bushfires, as an example, I think the messaging and the engagement through the COVID-19 experiences has reminded us all that if we actually work together, if we have robust, meaningful debate, debate uh, that we use the best experts and the best evidence available, but we do it with civility and courtesy and we remember the the pleases and the excuse me's and the thank yous and we ask about the arguments we don't seek to character assassinate the individuals that have a view there's nothing wrong with differing and divergent views we've got to stop destroying the individuals because they have them uh, what we've got to do is focus on policy debate rational sensible argument and it's amazing as we've seen in the last few years that when we do pull together that when we do constructively argue about the facts and the options and the limitations, authenticity matters. So if we can be very real and honest about what we're dealing with, if we can be pragmatic and open about the solutions and the strategies and the directions going forward, boy, we achieve some results. We achieve some remarkable results because we actually work together for the common good. Despite our varying and differing opinions, they're all healthy, but let's not dominate, let's not be dominated by the lunacy or the or the or the hysterical elements at either end of the spectrum on any debate that we're actually going to need to help us all get through things going into the future. That's what I'd like to see: a return to the to the to the subject matter debate, 
not the character assassination because people have got different views and opinions. That is a perfect optimistic way to end this uh, discussion. Shane, we've covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. I just wanted to say, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your time today. It's really very, very much appreciated amongst your busy schedule, but also thanks on behalf of everyone here at the Social Good Summit for all of the fantastic uh, good that you have done for the people of New South Wales and Australia. It's really appreciated and we appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Andrew. It's been a pleasure and all the very best for a, for a great summit. Cheers. Thanks, Shane.